be a little bit here if you just find the ice cream, but... And I'm sweeping down like the church. They have a little and I'm dripping service. Down the and they have a little good service. And... And I'm just sweeping the church. It's just a deep. <laughs> and they can't stop. So, uh... <laughs> You may not like it if you sound like you may, but don't touch the phone service. You may have good phone service, but don't. Hey guys, Nathan from Duck River Honey, and I wanted to take a few minutes to update everyone on my honey house that I'm building out of a shipping container. Uh, this is a 40 foot high cube shipping container, and I've had some questions on it, so I'm gonna update you on what I've done so far, how it's working, what my plans are going forward. I wanted to start out uh, answering a question that Bob Benny asked me, or mentioned, in a friendly way. Uh, when I was interviewing him for my Building a Full-Time Bee Business series. you got to be smart about where you're heading, too. What, what's that old saying? Buy right or buy twice? Something, yeah, something like, like that. Something yeah. like that, yeah. There's something to be said for that, too. If you know you're only going to be using something for a year or two or three, and you have the wherewithal to purchase the one that you're going to step up to three years from now, maybe it would be smarter to bite that off and do it now, that might come in the, you know, I was watching your videos on your honey house and I couldn't help but wonder, you know, what's his next step? Where's he going next? Is he going to have to build a building here? And if you had the money, which maybe you didn't, 
would it might have been a little wiser to go the building route in the first place? Maybe you don't want to grow any. And now, I'm, forgive me. And now I'm asking you questions. But uh, do you see yourself outgrowing those containers and all of that? Uh, he basically asked me if I was going to outgrow the containers and. If I had the wherewithal, would you have been better off with a building from the start? Uh, basically, it's uh, the argument of buy once, cry once uh, versus taking steps and spending money on all these steps versus just biting off a chunk and getting what you really need uh, in three or four years. Go ahead and, and doing that now. I've got some reasons for doing it the, the way that I am. Um, where I want to build a building on the farm is on the front corner. It's got road frontage. It's got electric nearby. It's got city water nearby. And it would be easier to get semis in there. And if we ever wanted to sell that corner of the property with that building on it, it would be multiple use. There's other farmers around that would use it. So that's really the spot where I would want to put it. Also, if we have people coming in to buy honey, uh, in a retail setting, something along those lines, it would be on the front corner of the property, wouldn't have people in the inside of the property. So the problem is that my 101 year old grandmother owns that property still, and I don't, so I'm not going to build on it um, until I can get ownership of it, if I can get ownership of it. So that's something that I think about. I do own some property in the back of the farm that I could put a building on. So there, there are some other reasons that I'm not jumping into that right off the bat. And the big one is cash flow um, and equity. I don't want to use a lot of debt, if I could even get the debt, to build, a, to fund expansion on a business and then hope that the business can pay back that debt. That's a recipe for bankruptcy. Um, that's how people go bankrupt. They, they try to start a business with debt instead of building a business as they go and it's more of a certain thing when they use debt to expand. Debt is a catalyst. It, it does nothing but speed up things. It, it will speed up your success or it will speed up your failure. And I'm at a point in life where I'm unwilling to put my, family, my family's finances at risk. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm, I'm building this out of cash and trying to get into this as cheaply as I possibly can so that I can build my production, my supply, that would be my hive counts, my own honey production, and uh, once I get over my legal hurdle of getting my permitting, then I could buy honey from other beekeepers and that would allow me to expand my supply and offer a year-round supply to my wholesalers. This building will also hopefully buy me time to build up that wholesale network because there's a lead time on getting in with groceries. You know, I've got to have a reliable year round supply first and then I can go after groceries and the application process can take a, a year on some of those. So, um, you know, there's a lead time on all this and when I get a few years down the road, hopefully I've got the positive cash flow built up to where I can go into what I really need uh, with some equity and maybe do it from cash, maybe not. We'll see. Now, that, that begs the question, what am I going to do with these containers when I outgrow them? My immediate plan is to get inspected on this, get it permitted, and then within a year or two, I'll probably need another 40 foot high cube just to store honey in. And my plans for it would be just to get the container, get spray foam insulation in it, and stick an air conditioner in it to keep the, the temperature down to an acceptable level and just use it for storage. Um, a few years down the road, when I get a real, quote unquote, real building built, you know, I'm envisioning something like a 40 by 60 um, with 20 foot side walls and, and sheds off the sides. Well, if I stuck this container under a shed roof off the side and set it on a concrete pad with radiant floor heating, I've got a seven foot wide by 40 foot long insulated, heavily insulated box that is climate controlled. So I can use it as a warming room 
Uh, I can warm up crystallized honey in here. I could warm up drums of crystallized honey in here. I could use it as a drying room for honey supers during harvest. Um, you know, if a flooring in here won't stand up to forklift and drum dolly traffic, I could sheathe it with metal uh, even. You know, just take all this stuff out and just use it as an insulated box. And then other containers, if I repurpose them, they're great for storage. If I ever do get big enough that I would outgrow a, you know, a building that I would put on the farm here, I'd be looking for a commercial location. Um, I don't know that I'll ever get that big, but if I, if I did, I, I'd want a commercial location that's easy for trucking. I can get semis in here to the farm, but the road in here is paved, but it's got a couple of tight turns. It's not ideal by any means. I also don't have natural gas available. And, uh, you know, Bob Benny uses natural gas for most of his honey heating. Um, it's a cheaper alternative than electricity. So, and in some cases, it can be cheaper than propane. So, um, you know, those are considerations. I, I would probably want to be closer to town or closer to an interstate where I could get traffic and have a retail location. If I was going to have a real commercial operation, I'd, I'd want that sort of a location. But that's years down the road and I may never get there. I don't know that I want to get there. So site improvements for this location, there was a single wide trailer um, real close to here 30 years ago that got sold and moved out and they left the site improvements in the ground. That is why I set this container where I did because I tapped into the city water, um, I tapped into the old electrical service and I've just connected to the septic system. So that saved a lot of money. Uh, the septic system probably saved me $6,000 minimum. The electric service probably saved me two to 3,000. The water meter saved me 1,000. Um, so having those side improvements was a, a real uh, key in why I situated exactly where I'm at. The city water, um, my uh, my preacher Brent, he helped me with a lot of the the getting set up and the site improvements and stuff. And he had a good idea. He said that I was going to have trouble with my pipes freezing in this thing because I can't insulate underneath it very easily. And during the winter, I just want to let it go cold because it doesn't matter if honey is cold during the winter. You just want to keep it from getting hot during the summer. So. What we did is we trenched in and then put a frost-proof um, spigot. And that's got a, a valve or a drain in the bottom that when you close the valve, it lets the water in the pipe flow out. And uh, that keeps it from freezing. So I'm actually coming from that into the building and that allows me to drain the entire water system inside the building. So in the winter time, I don't keep water on in here. I drain it, fill the lines with air, and, uh, and don't have to worry about pipes freezing. The septic system, I just got that done. I had quite a bit of trouble finding someone to come over and uh, bring an excavator for just that small of a job. Uh, finally have gotten that done, and it's, it's an amazing thing, but uh, when you don't have septic, it's all you can think about, and when you do have it, you never think about it again unless it's not working. So um, I'm glad to have that done and now I can forget about it for a decade, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so I do have a 200 amp electrical service in here. Um, I could have probably got, gotten by with a 100 amp, but it's not much more expensive for the, the box and the service to run a 200 than it is a 100. I'm glad that I went with a 200 amp service because I ended up going with a tankless electric water heater and that thing uh, runs off of three 40 amp breakers. So it's using up quite a few, quite a few slots in my service panel uh, just to run this one thing. Now, the reason I went with that tankless electric, um, I really debated going with a propane because I think propane would produce more hot water faster and it would last longer but I don't have a propane tank here, a big propane tank, so I would either have to have one set by a company and then have trucks come in and refill it, and I didn't really want to do that, or I would have to start shuttling 100-pound propane cylinders out here 
and you know put them in the truck and take them and have them refilled and do it myself i didn't really want to do that either and then uh, it just made sense to me that i've got a 200 amp electrical service electrical is already here i don't have to refill it so um, to get through my licensing phase and get usable and sustainable why don't we do this easy cheaper option and then down the road we can improve that if it becomes a bottleneck so that's what i did um, i never really considered using a, a a an electric tanked water heater just because of space and you'll see in this honey house i, I made a lot of decisions because of space uh, it's it's small it's tight everything is in tight together and that's just a fact of life in here you know it's functional but it's not ideal so the floors uh, again i these shipping containers have got two layers of three quarter inch marine grade plywood there are metal struts spaced about every foot or so i don't know the exact measurement and uh, the plywood sits on top of those so i came in on top of that Put a layer of spectricide down put two layers of blue foam blue one inch foam it gives me about an r10 under the floor then i sheathed it with advantech which is very water resistant and then i came over that with a, a smart core pro vinyl plank flooring from lowe's it's a commercial grade flooring it uh, has a 20 mil wear layer and it's waterproof and it goes down easy so that's why i chose that I don't know that it would hold up to drum dolly traffic very well because honey drums will weigh you know 650 pounds or so so it may not hold up to dolly traffic drum dolly traffic uh, we will probably find out at some point if it, if it does or doesn't so ceiling and walls i'm going to use frp panels again those came from lowe's you see those a lot in commercial kitchens and bathrooms it's a fiber reinforced plastic and uh, they're real thin they're only a quarter inch thick or so and i'm going to put those up with the molding strips that you can get for frp and probably just use my narrow crown stapler that i use for frames to uh, staple that into the joists um, i think that'll work pretty pretty well i, I hope at least it's going to be a pain installing those because i've already got all the outlets in i've got all of my lights in so i'm going to have to measure and cut and um, try to cut all these holes in there it's going to be it's going to be a pain uh, to get all that in so let's talk about requirements a little bit um, in this honey house uh, according to my state walls floors equipment and ceilings in food prep areas handling storage etc must be of a light color smooth non-absorbent and easily cleanable if concrete floors are used they must be sealed so my flooring is waterproof and cleanable frp panels are waterproof and cleanable i'm going to meet that requirement uh, all wiring and plumbing must be installed in a way that does not obstruct or prevent cleaning behind wall in parentheses um, i did install everything in the walls and what i did with these walls is this is two by fours on 16 inch centers and what the ceiling is a uh, drop ceiling that's two by fours as well that allowed me to bury the plumbing and the electric in the walls and overhead and then still get some r13 insulation bats in um, so i'm pretty well insulated in here and it holds temperature well i've got the uh, the closed cell foam on the inside of the container and that eliminates condensation completely and it also adds a little bit of r value and then i've got the fiberglass insulation and the bats inside of that um, that's working pretty well so far uh, and i expect it to continue to work pretty well lights located over food prep and food display facilities must be shielded coated or otherwise shatter resistant i'm using led disc lights and i'll say buyer beware on these uh, it I got some cheap ones that were Chinese made from Amazon, got a 12 pack for like $78. And I think I've replaced eight or nine of those already. They just, they quit working. So um, I've had to buy quite a few new ones and I'm getting better quality ones as I go. And I've not had any issues out of the better quality ones. But now my light fixtures don't all match. So uh, if you've got OCD, that's something 
to think about. I really don't. It's a honey house, so I don't care if they're exactly the same color temperature, exactly the same size, look exactly the same, and, and all that. Don't really care too much. Uh, my state requirements um, do have a requirement for toilet facilities. I'm going to get an exception for that because this is on farm. My sister's house is just right here. My dad's house is right there. Um, and I'm the only employee of my business. You know, is it a business if you're the only employee? It's more like you own your own job. So um, uh, I'm going to get, I've talked with the state and they said that it is possible to get a, a, an exception to the toilet facility rule. Since I'm the only employee, only family members will work here and there are uh, residences within walking distance. So that's something to consider. On plumbing, provide that there is not backflow from or cross contamination between piping systems that discharge wastewater or sewage and piping systems that carry food, water for food or food manufacturing. Uh, backflow prevention is something I need an education on. I think I'm in spec currently. Um, I do have a hose reel here with a 50 foot rubber hose. Uh, I'll mention real quick, I get these hoses from uh, Rich Tool Systems and it's made by Continental and it's a 100% rubber hose. They're, they're really nice, three quarter inch uh, rubber garden hose. And then Ely hose reels, I, I really like those for a manual garden hose reel, they're very well made. Uh, they're not as expensive as some of the industrial reels you, you'll get. They're very good quality though. So I do have a hot and cold water uh, hose outlet, and this has built-in backflow prevention here. I'll get some footage of this and show it to you. Another requirement is that all outer doors and restroom doors must have self-closures. So I did install a self-closure on my, my man door. Potable water is a requirement. I'm on city water here, so that's not an issue. But if, we're out, if I were on well, I would have to pass an annual inspection uh, by TDA to make sure that my well water is pure enough. I've got a requirement in here that I have a hand sink, a two or three bay equipment sink, and a mop sink. All those have to have trapped drains. And I've got to have a floor drain with a trap drain as well. And it's all gotta be on septic. So with my existing septic system, it's been abandoned over here since the early 1990s. What I did is I had to find that tank, which was a pain in the rear. Let me tell you, I was looking for it in July and August and was digging holes with post hole diggers and this red clay over here, it was so hard to dig and I didn't find it. So I waited until December when we got a lot of rain, ground soft, and I borrowed a probe from a neighbor and I found it within an hour uh, with the probe. So I guess that speaks to uh, you know everything in its proper time. It's a whole lot easier to do things at the right time. And then with the septic tank, all I had to do once I found it was expose the top of the tank. I had T-Deck come out. I think it's T-Deck, Tennessee Department of Environment something or other and um, he inspected it basically he looked at it and said yep there's a septic tank there's an, exi an existing system here and he issued me a certificate of verification had the guy come in trench hooked up to it and that's all i've got to do um, of course i'm in a rural area so if you're in a city or something you may have more stringent regulations on the plumbing um, again space I got the smallest hand sink I possibly could with splash guards. Uh, the mop sink I picked up off Facebook Marketplace. I got a really good two bay equipment sink and I'll show you some close ups of this. I love this thing. It's one of the favorite pieces of beekeeping gear that I've got because I can have two five gallon buckets in each of these bays at the same time. Uh, so for washing buckets, this is the key. It's uh, really, really nice got a nice pre-wash on it. It works very well. The plumbing underneath these sinks, I put clean outs basically everywhere there's a change of direction. Um, on, on the end of the lines, if there was going to be an elbow, I put a TY with a clean out on it. It's got clean outs everywhere. I put three clean outs in the septic line. I used a three inch septic line 
and put three clean outs in that. I've got another clean out at the end of the honey house. Um, the, so I've got clean outs almost everywhere that you can have a clog. And I think that'll just make life easier down the road. Uh, when I did the interview with Bob Benny on his honey house, he had to jackhammer a hundred foot of concrete floor and replace a four inch line. So putting wax down um, a septic line is a bad thing. You know, if it was a bigger project here, I would probably go with four inch or even bigger than that, maybe. Um, but when I do a building down the road, if I get on a slab, I'm going to send the, the septic out of the building as soon as possible and tie into a line outside just so I've got as little plumbing underneath the slab as, as I can possibly get. Something to think about. Clean outs and don't bury your plumbing in in uh, concrete if you don't have to. So on the electrical, um, I've got so many outlets in here, it's sort of ridiculous. I think I, the most that I skipped was two joists. Um, I'd put a, a box and then skip two joists, put another box all the way down, and I put uh, double gang boxes at the end of the, of the container because that's where I'll bring my honey supers in and then stack box fans on top of them to get them uh, to dry honey out. So I've got a ton of plugs down there. Uh, I don't believe that I've got more than three outlets on one 20 amp circuit. And most of them are two. So two outlets per circuit. I've got two outlets up here at the head of the building that are uh, one outlet per box. And those are, are 20 amp boxes. The only thing I've got left to do on the electrical, and I wish I had already done this, but I didn't bite the bullet is put in some 240 volt plugs uh, or some 240 volt outlets and it's going to be a pain to do now because i've already got the insulation in i'm going to have to detach some of that and probably go up and then run it uh, through this drop ceiling will be the easy way to do it but i want to get some 240 volt outlets in at the end of the building and then maybe a couple up here and that's for two reasons when i make the switch to drums I've got to have a way to warm drums and I may use a band heater or a power blanket or a Swinty immersion heater. Um, the band heaters are usually 240. The power blanket you can get 240 or 120. The Swinty immersion heater, the drum heater, is 240 only. The, the other reason is a lot of the bottling tanks, like the old Kelly bottling tanks, Daydance bottling tank, will run off of 240 and it's going to be a whole lot easier for me to install this now even though it's more difficult than if i had done it before now than it will be after i get the walls closed in so um, i'm just going to go ahead and do that i'll run two or three or four more wires and put in some more circuits fill out my box a little bit you know may as well may as well just try to future proof this thing a little bit more this air conditioner unit up here is actually got a heater in it as well. I've got it on heat and set to 60 now, and that's just to keep any water inside my tankless hot water heater from freezing. Although I do have the ability to drain this thing. Um, the biggest problem with this was I didn't have these valves. I had to source these and put these on here. This will allow me to um, drain this tank out and fill it with water and all sorts of good stuff. So um, the cost of the hot water heater was not everything in this. The wire was expensive. Um, you know, the, the electrical was expensive and then the, the valves were expensive as well. There's the extractors. Uh, this one is existing, but I put a leg kit on it to save some space. And that one's new. I don't know that you guys have seen that. There's my FRP panels. I'll have to figure out what to do to cover the back walls here. I'll probably just pad that out with wood and then screw uh, FRP straight to it. But uh, i got to figure out how to do that nicely. And then my floor drain... And this is my old container 
20 footer that I was using as a honey house in year two, I guess. Got molding for FRP here. Starting to build up a supply of sugar. I need more than that, quite a bit more, I'm sure. There's my hive lifter. Finally found a spot to put it where it doesn't take up an obscene amount of room. And I've got bottle storage back here. Built these shelves out and uh, I need to build more in here. All right, so the cost on all this stuff, uh, the container was about $6,000 delivered. The uh, two kits that I did from, I think it was Industrial Supplies in Louisiana is the company that sold, that sold the um, spray foam kits. Those were $1,750, $1,800 uh, for the two of them shipped. And that's from memory now. So um, give me some slack if I'm a little bit off. I, I think that's pretty accurate. And I looked this morning in QuickBooks and everything that I have allocated to the honey house facility that's things that are attached to the walls it can't be taken out and reused like this sink i wouldn't put that in that category i put this in equipment the extractors are equipment if i upgrade over time um, i can sell those and recoup some money but the flooring i'm not going to get any money back from that the hot water heater probably not um, insulation and walls and all that stuff is nailed down so the cost that i've got allocated to the facility right now it's about eighteen thousand, a little bit more and i don't think that includes the uh, frp panels and the septic install that i just did so i expect i'm gonna be in this thing for about 20 when everything is said and done uh, by the time i get permitted and you know that's a lot of money but the building that I want to build is probably going to be a 150, 200,000, and this will get me, hopefully, will get me through to where I can afford that. So I think it makes sense. I hope it works well. If anybody else is thinking about doing this, uh, shoot me some questions if you want to, either in the comments or you can uh, email me info at duckriverhoney.com. And uh, I think the next part of this series will be after i get inspected you know what they said whether i pass or fail i'm probably going to fail the first one uh, it's hard to get questions answered from these folks you know that they work for the state and i know they're busy and they're overworked and all this but i email questions and email questions and i don't get answers so i think what i'm going to have to do is just request an, an inspection and then have them come out and fail me and they'll give me a list of the reasons why they failed me and then I correct those and request another inspection. Um, you know, it's February right now, so I've got the time to do that before my honey harvest in June. Um, so that's sort of the, the timing I'm thinking about here. Well guys, I appreciate you watching. Like I said, if you've got any questions, ask below or shoot me an email. I'll try to answer those. I'll see you on the next one.